It is time for questions to the Minister of the Environment. Before we commence, I must inform the House that questions 1, 4 and 5 have been withdrawn. I therefore call Mr Joe Byrne. Mr Byrne. Minister. The European Commission has put in place transitional arrangements to allow member states to opt out of growing approved GM crops. To take advantage of these arrangements, Member States must let the Commission know by Friday the 2nd of October. Responsibilities for matters relating to the deliberate release of GM material into the environment, including GM crops, rests with me. Accordingly, the Member may be aware that last night I announced that I am prohibiting the cultivation of GM crops here. As I remain unconvinced of their advantages, I considered it prudent to prohibit their cultivation for the foreseeable future. In addition, the pattern of land use here and the relatively small size of many agricultural holdings create potential difficulties if we were to seek to keep GM and non-GM crops separate. I consider that the costs of doing so could potentially be significant and in many cases totally impractical. Furthermore, we are rightly proud of our natural environment and our rich biodiversity. We are perceived internationally to have a clean, green image. I am concerned that the growing of GM crops, which is acknowledged to be controversial, could potentially damage that image. Mr. Byrne, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. Would the Minister accept that there is, is some concern? that there may be some imported foodstuffs coming into Northern Ireland that have been genetically modified in their country of origin, and this may happen to animal feedstuffs. And secondly, can the Minister state if he had any discussions with his counterparts in the Republic, given that we have a relatively small island and GM is an issue for all in the farming community? Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank Mr Byrne for those supplementaries. I certainly do accept that the agriculture industry as we know it would not be viable without the use of imported GM animal feed. However, I am certainly satisfied that the approved varieties of genetically modified feed pose no risk to either the environment or human health. As regards uh, conversations or discussions with my counterpart, uh, Minister Alan Kelly, in the, the Republic, uh, at official level, there has been ongoing dialogue over the past month on this issue. While no announcement has been made yet uh, by Dublin, I anticipate that there will be one soon and that they will make the right choice too. Uh, the member quite rightly identifies potential issues should uh, the Republic of Ireland take a different approach to us on this. But given, I suppose, the similarities between size of agricultural holdings in the Republic and in, indeed the fact that they, like us, depend so heavily on that clean green image when it comes to exporting our produce across the world, which we do do so well. Uh, I'm fairly confident that they will agree with me on this issue. Well, Ms. Sandra Overend. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And indeed, there are many questions that could be asked from the Minister in relation to GM, uh, to GM crops, uh, and indeed uh, the importation of, of meat um, that has come from animals fed by GM crops. Um, but will the Minister agree that the guiding principle should be to follow science in this perspective? And can the Minister confirm that this was the case in his uh, decision yesterday? I thank uh, the member for that supplementary question with all these GM questions. I feel like I'm on GMU. Uh, there is a lot of science out there on this issue and uh, scientists are like lawyers, I should say. Different scientists do have different opinions and draw different conclusions on uh, different subjects. There is science out there and I've received criticism and correspondence from scientists over the past 24 hours on my stance that says GM uh, crops are great, they pose no risk at all. However, there are also scientists out there who take an opposing and contrary view. My guiding principle when it comes to making decisions is a precautionary principle. I'm charged with safeguarding our environment here in the North, and until 
there is complete and robust scientific evidence that this is safe, then I would certainly be unable to approve the cultivation of GM crops here. However, this is just we're talking about what is currently the GM approved list uh, that the EU Commission have. There could be in the future, and I have no doubt in the future, there will be additions to this list. And my decision, while I have made it, and it is a strong, I, I believe, statement of, of intent, my decision isn't carved on stone. And at, when and as new crops are added to this list, I or a future minister will have the ability to revisit this position. I'll call Mr. Jim Allister. Um, could I ask the minister? This clearly is a controversial issue, and it patently is a cross-cutting issue, given the Department of Agriculture's interest. Did he take this decision to the executive, and has he got executive approval? And has he not, in fact, created an untenable conundrum, whereby he acquiesces? in the feeding of our livestock with imported GM product, but he rejects cultivation of GM approved products which have passed through the entire sifting process of the EU? I thank uh, the, the member for that question. As it stands, I can make decisions on what is before me. I was required to make a decision on this matter, on genetically modified crops. Uh, by the 3rd of October, and I have done so. I understand the member's confusion as regards uh, other genetically modified foods, and it's not dissimilar to the point that uh, Joe Byrne had raised with regards to uh, GM f feedstocks. With regards to responsibility for this decision, responsibility for the deliberate uh, release of GM material into the environment, including GM crops, rests with me as Minister for the Environment. However, as a courtesy, I did write to Michelle O'Neill, the Dard Minister, to notify her of my position and then my decision. I call Mr Chris Hazard. I only had until October. <laughs> Kesha, number three, let hold question number three. Nuclear energy and nuclear installations are accepted matters under the Northern Ireland Act 1998 and as such are not within the remit of the Department of the Environment. Radioactive discharges from the Sellafield site are regulated by the Environment Agency and the Office for Nuclear Regulation. My department has responsibility for monitoring the environment in Northern Ireland to assess the impact of radioactivity produced elsewhere, including nuclear facilities such as Sellafield. NIEA has a comprehensive environmental monitoring program to assess any such impact on the Northern Ireland coastline. The programme includes checks on the radiation levels of the coastline at approximately 50 locations around the north, as well as monitoring the levels of radioactivity in seawater, seaweed, shellfish and fish. The adequacy of the monitoring programme is reviewed regularly and, where appropriate, will take into account any changes in the discharge of radioactivity from Sellafield. The results of the programme are published annually in a joint report, Radioactivity in Food and the Environment, produced by the four UK environment agencies in conjunction with the Food Standards Agency. Results for last year, like those in previous years, indicate that the levels of contamination are negligible in terms of radiological impact on the population of the North. On average, people in Northern Ireland receive 2,500 microsieverts of radiation a year from all natural and artificial sources. Of this, 50 per cent is due to exposure to radon in the home, 12 per cent from medical exposure, and less than 0.1 per cent from nuclear discharges. It should be noted that the lowest yearly dose likely linked to increased cancer risk is 100,000 microsieverts. In addition to this comprehensive monitoring program, the UK has a 24-7 nuclear radiation monitoring and emergency response network known as RIMNET. Well, Mr Hazard for supplementary. Well, I'd like to thank the Minister for his, for his answer thus far. In an answer to the previous question, the Minister said he had responsibility for safeguarding our environment. Uh, in light of this, uh, and in connection, I suppose, to not just the radioactive impact I suppose, of a plant of Sellafield, but in recent months we've actually had the news of uh, increasing numbers of British munitions washing up on the South Down beaches. Including, and, and a lot of this was dumped after the First and Second World War, including nerve and sarin gas. 
to what extent does the Department have any responsibility to safeguard the South Down environment to look at this issue uh, with possible radioactive um, you know, military materials that were dumped now washing up onto our beaches in South Down? Gorm I, I, I thank uh, the member for that supplementary. Now, neither I nor my department would be experts when it comes to arms dumps. Uh, however, uh, and, and the, the dumps to which the member refers fall within Scottish waters and therefore are not the direct responsibility of my department or the Northern Ireland Environment Agency. However, I am aware of the issues raised by uh, th these dumps to many uh, areas across the north, but in particular and in recent times to uh, the South Down uh, coastline. Correspondence has gone from my department that actually preceded my time as Minister uh, around this. Responsibility when something does come ashore rests with local authorities, so it would be up to the local council to remove that. However, given the dangerous nature of these materials, there would be assistance uh, from Britain at that time to do so, and there would be an input from the Northern Ireland Environment Agency as well. Call Mr. Sean Roger. Thanks. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Minister, can, can you outline your assessment of the, how Sellafield's nuclear power plant impacts on the North's coastal environment, the communities that live there? Given um, you know, Eddie McGrady's uh, com campaign against Sellafield over the years, but given the major health concerns in South Down and the larger than normal occurrences of cancer in the area? Since the 1970s, my department has had a very comprehensive programme in place to assess the impact of radioactive discharges into the Irish Sea on the coastline of Northern Ireland. The results of the programme are published annually in a report, as I outlined in an earlier answer, Radioactivity in Food and the Environment, which is issued jointly by all the environment agencies on these islands. The report focuses on key information that demonstrates that within the North, Food is safe, and the public's exposure to ionising radiation from discharges is insignificant. The health concerns raised by the member are ones that have been raised before, and I know there have been long and loud campaigns uh, from South Down, from elected representatives in South Down on behalf of the people of South Down over the years. People do have concerns about potential impacts on their health, and rightly so. And while these reports indicate that the effect of discharge from Sellafield and other nuclear plants is negligible, I fully appreciate that those, uh, those concerns will persist. All I can do is ensure the Minister that my department and the agency will continue to do everything they can to monitor the situation. With regards to other health impacts, those uh, questions would probably be better directed towards the Minister for Health. Uh, there would probably be a 10-minute window next Monday when they can do so. Call Mr Basil McRae. Question number six. While climate change is often and rightly seen as a global issue, we are all too aware of the impact that it is having at a local level. Impacts such as severe weather events, which threaten our health, our homes, our businesses and our way of life. That is why I have publicly stated many times my view that we all can and indeed must do more to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. The main aim of the 2015 United Nations Conference in Paris will be to achieve a new international agreement to create the vital framework the world needs to limit the average global temperature increase to below 2 degrees Celsius. And successfully doing so, we will help to combat climate change effectively, boost the transition towards resilient, low-carbon societies, and avoid the worst impacts of climate change. The Paris Conference is without doubt an opportunity for the world's leaders to deliver a global climate agreement which is unquestionably in our and the entire global community's best interests. We cannot underestimate how critical that is, and that was further underlined last week when Pope Francis held an unprecedented audience with all the European environment ministers and commissioners, appealing to them to show leadership and push for a long-term decarbonisation goal. 
I have written to the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, Amber Rudd, indicating that I do intend to go to Paris, where I will be making it clear that we should be striving to secure an ambitious international agreement this year and be pushing for opportunities to increase the EU emissions reduction target further as a result. Call Mr. McRae for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I say to the Minister that I fully support his decision to uh, attend the uh, UN meeting in Paris? Uh, my question for him in this environment is how many other MLAs do you think in this chamber would support his concern about climate change? And given that we are in the middle of Environment Week, which I know that uh, Ms Lowe and the Minister uh, were uh, in attendance last night, what importance do you think that has for Northern Ireland in a local sense in terms of tackling climate change? Uh, I thank the, the member for that question. In response to the, the first part of the question, there aren't that many MLAs in the chamber. <laughs> but, of, but of those present in the chamber, I'd be confident that the vast majority of them would support me and will support me uh, in my efforts to tackle climate change and to secure that international agreement that is required. Uh, with regards to the other question, Environment Week did kick off last night. It's been uh, extremely successful so far, and I would encourage all members here to drop into the Long Gallery to participate, or at least to observe. Uh, 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 events as well today. I'd like to congratulate the Environment Committee for their initiative and Neil Northern Ireland Environment Link for their work in, in making the week uh, possible and in coordinating uh, events. I'd like to just reiterate to the member my commitment to working across government and with all sectors of our society as well as all sections within this House to agree on measures that can help to address both future and current climate change. My department has already implemented a number of key actions to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's not something my department can do alone. We do need other departments to sign up and buy in. There are ongoing cross-departmental working groups and meetings in this regard. And I do believe progress is being made. It might not be being made as quickly or dramatically as we would like, but it is being made. And, and I think some people in this chamber, and maybe not in this chamber at the moment, maybe not in this chamber in, anymore, are beginning to accept uh, the impact of climate change and the importance of doing something about it. Call Mr. Ian Somerville. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can the Minister give his assessment on the emphasis that our new local councils have placed on reducing their emissions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for uh, the question. His first to me. I know he's just fresh out of local government, uh, so hopefully he had some input into his uh, councils or his former councils' stance on reducing greenhouse gas emissions before coming here. I think the new councils have an extremely important role to play, and I think. By and large, councils have embraced that uh, when it comes to tackling uh, climate change. I believe the opportunities that they have to do so are huge, be it through their community planning, be it through even their work on their own local development plans, because it will now become more and more a factor when applications come in for planning permission. Uh, factors such as environmental or wider impact around the emission of greenhouse gases and so forth will be taken into consideration when applications are being assessed. As I said, to date, I think councils recognise they have a role to play. They've signed up to play that role, but it's important that we as a department and we as an assembly support them in doing so. Call Ms. Anna Lowe. Mr. Principal, Deputy uh, Speaker, uh, I'm delighted the Minister is going to the Paris Conference on behalf of uh, Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, does the Minister agree that the lack of a Climate Change Act for Northern Ireland uh, will hinder 
our role or any actions from Northern Ireland in, uh, in addressing climate change? I uh, thank the member for that question. Uh, unfortunately, my wife does not share Ms Lowe's delight that, that I could be going to Paris in December, but hopefully a, a present on my return might speak now. I, I don't think Mr Alistair would approve of that. <laughs> I, I, I certainly do believe that a climate change bill and consequently a climate change act is very important uh, for Northern Ireland. I do now have the mandate to pursue uh, such a bill in the Assembly following a vote taken last year on an amendment brought by Mr Agnew to a, a, a motion on an illegal landfill. Uh, however, I have to be sure that if I am going to bring forward a bill, that I will have the support of the whole Assembly in doing so. That is the only way this can work. And that is why I, I think the work that I have been doing to date with other departments, with other sectors, not just the environmental uh, NGOs, but very importantly, industry, those who might perceive that the Climate Change Act would inhibit or prohibit their, their growth as, as an industry uh, is extremely important. Uh, we have to bring people along. We also have to explore the opportunities that could be created within our local economy by a Climate Change Act through new green energy initiatives and so forth. And I had touched in response to an earlier question on the clean green image of the North and how that has helped our agri-food industry become so successful. I believe that development of that clean green image can only help us grow from strength to strength in that regard. Call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers? And could I join uh, with the Minister in congratulating Northern Ireland uh, Environment Link uh, and indeed the Chair and the Deputy Chair of the, uh, the Environment Committee for promoting uh, Environment Week here uh, and the Minister's participation as well in that? Um, could, could I ask the Minister? Uh, Apropos what he has said about uh, a climate change, uh, a climate change legislation, is there any way of building a consensus within the Northern Ireland Executive and indeed within the Assembly that we can all go to, uh, go forward together uh, in bringing about an agreed uh, climate change act? Because I do think it's essential uh, that we work together uh, and that we map out uh, an approach which will be beneficial to the whole community. Thank the member for that question, and I suppose repeat the point that I had made uh, to Ms. Lowe that I believe that a collaboration is vital to reaching consensus, and I believe that consensus is vital to achieving success in this regard. I have constantly, <laughs> I think, uh, outlined the need for our own climate change legislation with challenging greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, and I believe that this would certainly create greater clarity and the long-term certainty that business and industry need, those very sectors, some, of, uh, some members of which feel that uh, climate change legislation would be detrimental to their growth. As I said, I've had uh, some extremely challenging yet extremely productive uh, meetings with representatives from these sectors. I th believe there's still a lot more work to do. However, uh, an initiative that, that I had launched last year around uh, prosperity agreements, I believe, demonstrates clearly to industry and to business the benefits of environmental compliance are actually going beyond compliance to them in terms of uh, how successful their business can be. I have established a prosperity panel composed of local and international experts to advise me on how to turn issues such as climate change from being a barrier to growth into economic and social opportunities. I am glad that that panel also has representatives of the business uh, and industry here and, and very importantly, uh, the agri-food industry, which again, I, I can't emphasise enough the importance of that industry to our economy here in the north. Call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Number seven, please. 
Under the departmental restructuring, most of my department's environmental functions would be inherited by a proposed new department, the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, DERA. I believe these proposals, as they stand, could create conflicts of priorities and responsibilities within the new DERA. In short, the present arrangements for environmental governance will become even more out of line with what is regarded as good practice in Ireland, Britain and elsewhere in Europe. Most of these jurisdictions have some form of independent environmental protection agency. In August 2011, my predecessor, uh, Minister Atwood, published a discussion document on environmental governance in Northern Ireland. Most respondents expressed support for the creation of some form of agency or body within the public sector, but operating separately from central government to undertake a range of environmental roles and responsibilities. However, it was recognised that without sufficient support from other political parties, making such changes to our environmental governance arrangements could not be pursued at the time. With such large changes to our departmental structures being made in the very near future, I believe that now is the right time to revisit this debate. I have reached the clear conclusion that our present governance models are in need of radical review and need to be replaced and replaced quickly. As a first step, I now intend to open up a debate about an independent body within the Assembly and Executive so that this can be factored into restructuring plans that are underway. I will do everything that I can to deliver this quickly, but I also need other political parties to give their support and commitment to make this happen. Well, Mr. Eastwood, first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the, the Minister for his answer. Um, does the Minister agree with me that any independent body, any independent environmental protection agency, should really be done on an all-Ireland basis if we really want to protect the environment in, in the places that it's needed? I thank the, the member for that supplementary question. Ireland's environment knows no borders. Therefore, I believe that we should ensure, at this time of great change, that our environmental governance arrangements are well aligned with arrangements in the South. That way, we are well positioned to build on the collaborative work that is already carried out under the auspices of the NSMC. In my view, an independent, all-island environment protection agency is the best way forward to allow us to develop collaboration and to pool resources. I recognise that officials north and south have not yet fully considered the implications of an all-island environmental protection agency, and so, as a first step, I am opening up the debate about an independent body in the north within this assembly and within the executive. Call Mr. Alex Maskey. The principal deputy speaker, uh, question number eight, please. The Bowl car parking service was an unauthorised car park use, which was refused planning permission in December 2013. The refusal was subsequently appealed and comprehensively reviewed by the Independent Planning Appeals Commission. The PAC dismissed the appeal in June 2015. The PAC found that there had been a failure to demonstrate the quantitative need for the car park and that there were sufficient areas of parking, including overflowing parking areas, to meet the needs of the city airport. In coming to their view, the PAC concluded, taking account of all the evidence, that whilst there may be a demand for cheaper parking, this did not equate to a need for additional parking at the airport. I understand that the car park was closed by the owner of the site following the PAC decision to dismiss the appeal and receipt of a warning letter from Belfast City Council to cease use of the site. Mr. Maskey, first supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I mean, thank you, Minister, for that response. But the Minister not agree that, albeit there was no uh, planning uh, legislative requirement to block this particular application on the basis that it was a question of demand as opposed to need, um, but would the Minister not be prepared to try to work with the Bulls because obviously if there is a demand for it, then clearly that speaks for itself. So would it not be worthwhile for the Minister to have some discussions with Bulls to try to see if the facility can actually work? Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I, I thank the, the member for that question. 
uh, I, I agree fully uh, with the, the, the member when this decision was first reached, the first I heard about it on its initial or after its initial refusal in December uh, 2013 was uh, through the media. A refusal had been issued, at which stage nothing really could be done about it. Uh, given how ridiculous it seemed to me at the time, I actually invited uh, the Bowles uh, to appeal and uh, was disappointed in the outcome of that appeal. I have subsequently met uh, Mr Pat Bowl, owner of, of the business, uh, as, along with uh, planners within the department, to discuss a best way forward uh, for him. I, I fully accept that this gentleman and this enterprise actually tried to do everything by the book, and on this occasion the system did not work for them and is now not allowing uh, them to work. Within the strategic plan and policy statement, which is still awaiting executive approval, hopefully I'll be able to get it out soon, there will be greater flexibilities afforded to councils, who are now the planning uh, authorities, to make decisions within their own areas ar around what would be deemed sufficient uh, car parking. And I would very much hope that Belfast City Council will, along with Mr Bowler, or potentially uh, someone else, would be able to work together and they will know what the need is in their own city or council area. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions. The members listed for topical questions 1, 4 and 9 have withdrawn their names. I therefore call Mr Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, my colleagues on Causeway Coast and Glens Council were informed yesterday that you decided last week that the North End and Area Plan would come into effect today. Could you give this House and me some update as to how that will affect my constituents? Uh, I thank the, the, the member for that question. And while the Council may have been informed just last week that publication of the Area Plan uh, was imminent, the Council have been integral and its uh, predecessor uh, councils have been integral in the formation and uh, formulation of that plan. The publication of this plan is a positive news story for the Causeway Coast and Glens Council area. It certainly is. It will provide certainty to developers, to potential inward investors, to providers of social housing and to communities. It will also be of great benefit to the Council as they uh, proceed with the drawing up of their new local development plan. Uh, I have yet to hear any negative rumblings coming from the Council or indeed constituents in that area as regards the content of the plan. However, should there be any, I'd be more than happy to meet with the member or whoever to discuss. Mr Swan for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister then give insurances when he refers to investors given certainty and can the communities given certainty? Can he assure this House and can he assure me that that area plan will ensure that lignite mining will not proceed within that area plan and that fracking will not proceed within that area plan in the area? I uh, thank the, the member for that question. As regards the issues that, that the member raises, the area plan would not uh, deal with such things. They would be dealt with separately under planning policy, and I would take this opportunity to uh, remind uh, the, the, the member of my own view uh, within, on fracking and uh, lignite mining, uh, which again will be strengthened, I hope, following the publication of the SPPS, and that is that no, no such activity should or could or will be carried out in the absence of sound, safe and evidence that it is sustainable and it is not detrimental to our environment or to human health. Uh, each application will be judged on its own merits. To date, there has been no application received anywhere in the North uh, for fracking. If the member has ongoing concerns around lignite mining, I would be happy to meet him and discuss uh, at a later date, or even this date, later on this afternoon. Mr Oliver McMullen is not in his place. I call Miss Anna Lowe. That's pretty quick. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. 
Um, I want to uh, thank members uh, who attended the Environment Week, as a number of uh, speakers have, have spoken of that. Uh, those members who attended yesterday and today. And there are also still events up in the Long Gallery and outside. I would encourage them uh, to participate in, in those events. The Minister, uh, during the reception last night and again today, mentioned about the his proposal for the independent uh, EPA, uh, North-South uh, um, uh, um, kind of cooperation, working together. I just wonder, well, why I certainly uh, very much sympathise and, and understand the rationale and the sentiments of the North-South body he proposed, how is he realistically going to have consensus for it? I, I thank uh, the member for that question. And just before I answer it, just I think in defence of Mr McMullen, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I had received notification of his question having been withdrawn. Uh, I, I believe that winning consensus for my proposal or for my vision won't necessarily be easy, but that certainly will not discourage me uh, from the pursuit of what I believe to be the best outcome for the environment north and south of this island. Uh, I, I, I did outline in response to an earlier question that Initially, the first debate that we have to have and the first debate that I will need your support in is to establish the principle here in Northern Ireland of setting up an independent environmental protection agency. I believe strong arguments can be made for that. I, I, I have yet to hear any compelling argument as to why we shouldn't have an independent environment protection agency every other jurisdiction on these islands does, and the vast majority of countries in Europe does. It's seen as best practice there, and it works there. I think we should be looking at models in other countries, seeing what, what is good about them, how we could make things better here. However, like I say, I do want to do this quickly. Fortunately, because of the relative recentness of uh, the, the, the consultation done in 2011 by my predecessor. I don't think we have to start from scratch. W w whenever we uh, open this debate, there is a, a, a template there. We have views expressed at that time. I don't expect them all or many of them to have changed too drastically. There are views that maybe will have changed and they will have changed in a way that they might be more welcoming of an independent environment protection agency than maybe they were uh, four years ago. Uh, but this isn't something that I want to force down the minister people's to throats. Conclude. Okay. Thank you. Call Ms. Lowe for supplementary. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, given the short time we have, though, I mean, I, I think the minister's right. Maybe the first step is looking at establishing in the north. Uh, in Northern Ireland, the, the EPA, independent EPA. But given the short time we have from now to the end of the mandate before the merging of the two departments, what is the process the Minister is planning to do to establish the uh, organisation? Uh, I thank uh, Ms. Lowe for that supplementary question. I believe it's because of the restructuring or the amalgamation of departments that this is exactly the right time uh, to carry out this piece of work. There are huge concerns across the uh, uh, environmental NGO sector and beyond that it won't be such an amalgamation of departments, but rather a takeover <laughs> of one department by another. And there is a, a huge fear out there. It may, uh, and I'll do everything I can to allay that fear, but the en environmental protection standards or environmental regulation will be compromised uh, as a result. I have said many times in this chamber that the mantra I've tried to bring to uh, th this ministry is the desire to create a better environment and a stronger economy. I believe that that can be achieved and can be achieved with an independent en environment agency However, we do need to convince other parties, we do need to convince other sectors of the merits of that. And like I said before, <laughs> I, got, I got cut off there. 
It's not something I want to ram down people's or groups' throats. It's something that I believe we can, we can make people understand, that we can make people see the merits of, and that we can make people sign up to. Can I thank the Minister for letting us know about Mr McMullen's withdrawal, but Sorry. I feel certain that Mr McMullen's party know what the procedure is for withdrawing questions. Call Mr Cathal O'Shea. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr President, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware of the unacceptable and dangerously high levels of nitrous dioxide, NO3, uh, in the Dungiven area, particularly the main street area, uh, some ten times more than the recommended European level. The solution to which, of course, will be uh, only found with the creation of the uh, Dungiven bypass. But can the Minister assure me that all efforts will be made to reduce these levels by whatever other means? I, I, I thank uh, the member for that question, uh, and I, have, I am indeed aware of the issue of traffic congestion going through Dungiven. I encounter it, it, it regularly and agree entirely with the member that one way to tackle the huge pol or very high pollution levels in Dungiven will be the creation of a bypass. So my, my party colleague, particularly John Dallet, has been particularly vociferous in, in campaigning for such a bypass. However, successive uh, DRD ministers have failed to, uh, to progress such an issue. As regards air quality, then, as it is, it is the duty of district councils under the Environment Order 2002 to periodically review and assess air quality within their areas. Where air quality is poor, and it is very poor and ungiven, then councils must declare an air quality management area, which is accompanied by an action plan containing measures to improve air quality. As it was, Limavady Council identified levels of nitrogen dioxide arising from transport emissions to be above objectives set out in the UK air quality strategy. The Council therefore de er, declared an air quality ma management area in 2008, which encompasses Dungiven's main street. Levels reported for Dungiven are, however, as high as they, they, they seem to us, they are actually comparable to other UK cities. But that's you're comparing Dungiven with UK cities uh, with maybe the population of, of Northern Ireland in them, with air quality problems related to transport, but they're also not the highest in that maybe London or Manchester has higher, <laughs> higher levels of nitrogen dioxide. Mr. Oshin for supplementary. Uh, I think to give us so its uh, study status sometime uh, in the future. Um, but will the minister also address the issues of other chemicals such as sulphur and indeed even particulates, which are also issues and are maybe not covered in the uh, monitoring for their quality management uh, agreement? I, I thank the member for that supplementary question. And well, uh, as I have outlined, responsibility for, for air quality lies with councils. Uh, the NIEA do work closely with councils on identifying problems in areas and, importantly, identifying or seeking solutions uh, for areas. So I could again reiterate my commitment uh, to the member that uh, my department will work closely with the council on this issue as we all work together on the bypass issue. <laughs> Ms. Claire Hannah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Minister will be aware of the issue of um, unregulated summer bonfires and, and the attachment that people uh, have to them, but also the risk to uh, well, property and, and, and community relations, particularly uh, for those bonfires that aren't in any management programme. C can the Minister outline uh, what's being done about some summer bonfire sites? Thank uh, Ms. Hannah for that question. Well, during this summer and every summer, Media coverage of massive bonfires in very close proximity to people's homes and the sectarian burning of effigies on bonfires did nothing or does nothing to promote good community relations, nor is it any advertisement of a place moving on from the past and working towards a better shared future. The legislative position relating to bonfires is extremely complicated and involves a number of public bodies. This can make enforcement and does make enforcement less effective unless there is a joined up approach. Legally, the ultimate responsibility for bonfires rests with the landowner. 
often a public body, although those engaged in antisocial and associated activities also carry certain responsibilities. District councils often take the lead responsibility for the overall management of bonfires, and some very good work is being done on this. A number of other bodies have enforcement powers, including the PSNI, the Fire and Rescue Service, and the NIEA from within my own department. It is likely that none of the major bonfires comply fully with the requirements of existing legislation. I think it is well past the time for hand-wringing about this being too difficult and a motive and issue to tackle, and I am prepared to take leadership to try and find workable solutions. I have been discussing this with my officials and have asked them to consider future op options which may have the potential to improve bonfire management and control. It is my intention to bring these proposals or options to the Environment Committee in the near future for discussion and consultation on the way forward, and then take a paper to the Executive. Time is up. I will 